Hello and welcome to Legacies of Reconstruction Tools for Conversation. For teachers and students alike, it's important to be able to connect the past to today. In this session, we're going to engage in object-based learning strategies to support conversations about our racial past and consider the relevance of reconstruction today. We'll guide you to reflect on as well as discuss this topic using close looking analysis and synthesis routines. My name is Brianna White. Um, I'm the head of education for the National Portrait Gallery and so fortunate to be here with the two of you to with the two of you, Kendra and Elizabeth today. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that, Brianna. I also am feeling very fortunate to be here with both of you. My name is Kendra Flanagan. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning within the Education Department at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'm Elizabeth Dale Dinas. I'm the Teacher Programs Coordinator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and Renwick Gallery. And I am super excited to see what we can do together in, progress. In, <laughs> in this setting. Um, if you'll bring us forward, please, to our first slide, just so that everybody knows what to expect from this session, I would appreciate it. We're going to begin with an entrance ticket. So this is a warning to go grab a piece of paper and a pen or pencil. When we're inviting you to think about your own high school experience. So what did you learn about reconstruction? And after you've filled this in for yourself, I'll give you a little bit of a preview of what we'll be doing next. But right now, please just spend one minute reflecting on when I was in high school, I remember learning fill in the blank about reconstruction. And just a bit of teacher talk as you're writing, we'll be coming back to this. So we'll be using this as a point of comparison, but it's also an interesting opportunity for us as facilitators to consider what we learned about reconstruction. And that's something we'll be discussing together and taking your questions about mirror to the end of the session. Um, what I'm going to do is ask you to put a pause on your writing. And then we're just going to stay on this slide for a moment. And just so that you know what's coming up, you get a little preview there. We're going to have community agreements, which are going to be opportunities to make sense of how we build space for um, a conversation where the, the topic is um, complex. And we're going to build some background knowledge. So if you're filling in this blank and saying, I don't remember anything that I learned about reconstruction, we'll build some of that in. We're going to do some close looking group reflection. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a panel discussion and some Q&A. Um, all the contents of this are in the learning lab. And just as a note for everyone, we are going to be inviting you to respond to some prompts. And if you would do that in the Q&A box, that would be really valuable. Thank you. So next slide, please. Kendra. What's well, important, conversations that touch on our identities need to really be approached with care and the necessary community building. And so one step that we can take in community building is to establish group agreements to support our interactions with each other. Ideally, we would co-construct our group agreements, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna share three of the foundational agreements that we often use and ask you to hold to these as we proceed through the session. First one is speak from the I perspective, which means that you will share only things for which you have personal experience or knowledge and using that I phrasing. The second one is practice active listening and active listening really helps us to slow down and listen with intention to one another. And this can really help to build empathy between people. And the third one is turn to a place of wonder. Sometimes when we're in discussion with someone, we may hear something that we don't understand or that we don't agree with initially. But in this case, what we're asking you to do is that you turn to wonder and you ask, say more about that or what do you mean by? Next slide, please. Beginning in 1865, for the first time, slavery did not legally exist within the U.S. borders. And really what this meant was the question before the nation, um, would 4 million newly freed people be truly free to determine their own lives? 
would the nation's founding promises of liberty, equality, and justice be realized for all people regardless of race? These are the questions of reconstruction and the questions that we continue to grapple with today. So before we start moving into um, the, the, the meat of our session, um, I'd like to revisit that entrance ticket and share just a couple of the comments um, that were coming in. Um, and I think one of the things that I really did notice was um, that the participants uh, really don't remember learning much about Reconstruction. Um, they learned terms like carpetbaggers, uh, that Reconstruction ended in the late 1800s. Um, and one of our participants noted that there were absolutely no non white people who contributed to reconstruction or nation building. Um, and that was that was their experience in high school. So hold on to hold on to those ideas um, as we continue through our session. Next slide, please. The National Museum of African American History and Culture has an exhibition on display called Make Good the Promises, Reconstruction and Its Legacies. This exhibition brings together stories of a country at a unique moment in its history, stories of Black achievement in spite of intentional oppression, and the stories of promises that remain to be fulfilled. To prime ourselves for this presentation, we're going to watch a two-minute trailer video for the exhibition. As you listen, share key words and big ideas in the Q&A box. Roll the video, please. 1865, the Civil War was over and millions of African Americans were determined to define and defend a new vision of freedom and equality, remaking America without slavery. It speaks to the hopes and dreams of those who were newly freed with the creation of Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War and the end of slavery. On September 24, 2021, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture presents Make Good the Promises, a powerful exhibition that tells this overlooked story of Reconstruction and its legacies. It means that the promise of full citizenship of equality for the newly freed has not been fully reached yet and continues to be a task this nation needs to try to fulfill. An era of possibility and change, reaction and resistance a movement of social and religious freedom, and political, educational, and economic empowerment that helped change our Constitution, despite devastating racial violence, intimidation, and broken promises. Through key features such as compelling artifacts, media and interactives, and a thought-provoking reflection space, this remarkable exhibition will bring the complex issues of Reconstruction into focus for visitors of all ages. Hear firsthand accounts from the formerly enslaved women and men who worked to create new communities and a new nation. Meet the revolutionary leaders who took a seat at the table in all levels of government to create an interracial democracy. Bear witness to the legacy of Reconstruction as it continues to resonate today calling upon our country to make good the promises of our Constitution in our politics, our economy, and our everyday lives. you thank you so much i am starting to see some responses that have come through in the q a box and some of the uh, keywords and big ideas that i'm seeing are new visions of freedom uh, 1865 as a beginning promises not yet fulfilled empowerment some of the words freedom, freedom and empowerment together, uh, broken promises, reaction. And I love this one that's coming up, possibility and change. 
let's begin applying and thinking more about some of these ideas and keywords that you all have shared and uncovering some of the complexity by looking at some portrayals of reconstruction. And one very particular one that we're gonna start with is from the perspective of artist Winslow Homer. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is an image, as Kendra said, um, that was created by Winslow Homer um, some years, as you can see from the tombstone text or the label text on the right side of the screen. It was created after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, and we're going to be looking at um, actually a second version of this. So um, just wanted to show you the image of record. That means that this is one that is unaltered. And in just a moment, we're going to be looking at a lightened version so that you can see all of the details that Homer included. And we'll actually be looking at it in two parts. And this is intentional um, as a strategy for supporting students slowing down and looking closely for details before they start telling stories. For warning, we're going to be doing See, Think, Wonder. And if you've done a bunch of See, Think, Wonder, I'm going to invite you to consider what happens when the routine becomes so routine that you spend less attention on the routine and more attention on the content. So if you move ahead one slide, please, we'll see one side of the artwork. And in this lightened version, you can see perhaps a little bit more of the background. You might notice some of the details in the clothing and perhaps some other items. And for the purposes of our time together to use it most wisely, I'm going to invite you audience members to write down three things that you see in this half of the artwork. And I'd also appreciate knowing from my colleagues who are here with me, what do you see when you look at this half? I, um, you know, I've seen this piece in the galleries and um, it really is, um, it, it really is quite powerful. And I'm always drawn to um, uh, what seems to be perhaps uh, a conversation um, between um, our two subjects um, in the, in the portion that we can see. Um, and yet uh, the, the woman who uh, has the apron on is facing us. Mm -hmm. um, and is not turned in the same direction um, as the woman on the far right. And as a person who works with portraiture, you're such an interesting <laughs> um, reader of body language. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. So we're noticing an apron, we're noticing two women, and we're noticing two different kinds of, um, of posture. Kendra, what do you see? My eye is drawn to what's around the figure's necks mm. and how one figure seems to have like a colorful, some sort of colorful type of cloth, maybe. I can't quite tell if it's separate from the bodice of the, the dress that's on or if it's a separate piece, but I do notice that it's kind of collected around the neck. And then mm -hmm. the other figure is wearing something uh, that looks like lace to me yeah. in the way that it's, um, the way that it's rendered looks like lace and I wonder are these being used uh, as indicators of status perhaps uh, mm -hmm. within this image um, so those 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 stand out to me and I noticed that the figure that is on our left so the the woman that for me by skin tone appears to be a black woman mm -hmm. um, has a, a head dressing on a head wrap on as well Thank you for mentioning that we see racial difference presented here too. Sometimes that's the thing that people perhaps avoid saying, um, but it's really important in this artwork to, to put it out there as a really in, important component. People in the chat are noticing there's like a wood door, thinking maybe it's a cabin, there's a bottle or a glass. Um, maybe noticing that there are less details for the African-American woman um, than we can see on the slide for the woman on the right who's white. Um, and then starting to ask questions, which is great. This is the beauty of um, putting forward an, an artwork that inspires curiosity. Why don't we look at the other half so that we see the whole thing all together? Will you page ahead one, please? Now we see the whole thing together. And what I'm going to invite you to do is not exclude the right side from your further um, inventory, but rather start to incorporate the left side. So as we look all around, maybe you'll notice that we see our original two figures, and then we see a smaller figure in, sort of in between, a standing figure um, just barely off 
from the, the smaller figure and then seated, which is the hardest figure, at least for me to see a, um, a fourth woman. So with all of that, if you would add maybe two more things that you see into the Q&A. And what do you see? I'd love to know one from each of you, Brianna and Kendra. Well, I'll, I'll start with this, this round. Um, one thing that I notice is that all of the African American, what I'm assuming are women in the picture are all have head wraps mm -hmm. on and that that um, what that is as a symbol in the African American um, community and African American uh, hair culture, and what that means. And so that that's something that I'm drawn to, from that perspective. Um, and I think the fourth figure, the fourth figure over to the left, um, just her seated position has always mm -hmm. drawn me in, I think partially because with the line of the, the the painting where most of the heads are kind of at this point and then her head is down and I kind of my eye follows and comes down to see her yeah. which draws me into to her as a figure thank you Brianna and what do you see I know I'm so interested in um the the overlap of our four figures on the left um it, it gives me the sense of like a familial connection. I know I'm doing exactly what you don't want me to do, which is <laughs> move into the thing, but I can't okay. help it, Elizabeth. <laughs> it's just that that overlap is um, is such a contrast, I think, uh, to the the white woman who is standing on the right hand side, um, all, you know, singly. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So just as we would with students to invite people into thinking is wonderful, right? So we're already starting to read body language and that sort of thing. But I just want to note that folks are noticing maybe a mother holding a child, um, noticing that the woman seated has her hands over her face or her hand over the face. Um, and this distinct difference in facial expressions also. So this is this is an artwork where I think I see a lot of tension because there is a woman standing singly and then a group of women who to me seem as though they are reinforcing one another. And so that's what I think when I see it. And I'm curious if that's the same think that you, Kendra and Brianna have. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That that I, is that's the tension. That that's what I was thinking. I I see I see the tension, but I also see protection mm -hmm. um in the group and so I think I would use that word probably um as another word as a, another possibility to the, to the reinforcement part is is like the protection. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder what the conversation might be about could the conversation be about the child mm -hmm. and so there's this you know protection that's happening there um for the child or you know is it is it just protection of their space and so they're kind of forming a almost a a, blo a block you know in further into their space there you know with us seeing the door um somebody pointed out the door with us seeing the door that perhaps that's the door that leads outside of their mm -hmm. space and so they're forming a, a block <laughs> to not move further into their space yeah thank you and i think that's i think what you've offered is um a, an opportunity for me to recognize a gap in my understanding and i know we're going to come back to that so when we start to um, think about wonders as maybe a formative or summative assessment for teachers. Um, I, I wonder a lot of things, and I think a lot of that is my wonders are born of my lack of understanding of this particular period in American history. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background information that Winslow Homer composed this painting from sketches that he made while traveling through Virginia with the Army of the Potomac during, um, not World War, Civil War. Um, and it was during this time that he would have been able to um, visit the quarters of enslaved people and was, I think, trying to depict um, the environment as he saw it there. What's interesting to note, of course, is that while he was doing that traveling and making those sketches during the Civil War, he didn't make this painting until 1876. And so my wonder, if I was going to pose a wonder, is why would Homer make this particular painting during Reconstruction? And I want to know more about what were his um, motivations. 
So rather than lingering too long on Winslow Homer, which of course we could do, I just want to see that um, between the end of the Civil War in 1865 um, and 1870, three constitutional amendments were ratified, the 13th Amendment, the 14th, and the 15th. And just to seed that in now, but I wanted to turn over the stage to Kandra because she's got an, um, an image that becomes a really compelling pendant piece to this one. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to shift our lens to spend time with this photograph and we're going to do a very similar process of spending some time looking so I would like you all to take 20 seconds and let your eye roam over this photograph and start to answer that question what do you see and then start dropping in what you're what you're seeing in the Q&A box and we'll take a, a chance to look at some of your comments but just what do you see in this photograph? So very similarly to how you looked at the painting. Do that again here. And asking my colleagues, what do you all see? <laughs> there, there's an expansiveness um, mm. to, to this one. Um, uh, it allows us, uh, you know, not just to, you know, take in uh, the, the figures, but also the landscape as well. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm struck by how scale, to your idea about landscape and expansiveness, how scale is captured here. So this woman on the leftmost side, the way she's presented is like she's as, as important as the house and the the livestock in the image and so the importance of an individual, the importance of a space that I would imagine is home and then also these animals who labor that this is a, a an image to me it feels more comfortable hmm that's interesting I I really like how you um both kind of pointed out the expansiveness that's not that that, that hasn't been something that kind of has stood out for me as the expansiveness of the photograph and so I and especially now thinking in comparison to the painting that we just looked at right that the the painting for me felt very intimate that we were right there in someone's home and then the expansiveness that you all are expressing with this photograph and so that's really amazing um, connection there to, to hear and to make and learning that I'm having in the moment real time <laughs> learning happening right here. Um, some of the comments that are coming through and from our participants are that they're seeing resilience. Um, uh, some people come, there's a family farm, they see a horse, a wagon, a shack. Uh, some say that the subjects seem to be intentionally posed, not a casual shot. And some of that could have to do with the um, technology, the technological capacities of photography. Um, mostly men around the wagon um, look similar to photographs of my sharecropper family of the same era. And that's really cool that you have photos of your family from this era. Uh, a cabin, a small house, the posture of the girls is standing out, a tree in the center. The men are all in darker colors. Uh, a lot of people are noticing uh, the, the working animals that are there, that are on the farm. That is, these are some really good things that you're pointing out and seeing in the comment. Uh, somebody has made a comment that I think is also really interesting and worth calling out is that there's a small fence around the property, so maybe it belongs to the family. Mm -hmm. mm. So I want you just to take another look at this photograph and just spend another 15 seconds just quickly looking in all the details, let your eye roam around, and then share in the Q&A, what are you wondering? As you look at this photograph, what do you wonder? What are some questions that come up for you? I saw that someone had already put a wonder in the chat and I'll just call this out and then I'll turn to my colleagues and see what they are wondering. Uh, someone says they wonder about the purpose of the image. And I just turn to my colleagues here. What do you all wonder? I wonder the name of the woman on the left. I wonder, I wonder what, what she likes to do and who she is and, and all of who her family is. Mm, mm, yeah, the name of the woman, that's nice. And, you know, similar to um, what one of the participants wondered about the purpose of the image, I, I wonder how it came to be, um, because photography is still, it's a fairly new art form right now, right? I mean, this is late 1800s. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how did it come to be, which mm -hmm. goes along with, 
with who was then going to see it after it was created? Yeah, it's a great question. Questions that I think when we do our, our, our object analysis and we're thinking about this, we always ask the questions, how was the object made? Who was it made for? How was it going to be used? And mm -hmm. I think that those questions are really applicable here in this moment. I see, I'm seeing a few others that are coming through um, from our participants. People are wondering, do they rent, lease, or are they sharecropping? Who owns the farm? When was it taken? Is, is this their property or is it owned by somebody else who took the photo? Are they in dialogue with someone? Uh, similarly to what you said, Elizabeth, someone's wondering who are who are these people, who the family is, and I think, you know, that power in being able to give names um, and restore that humanity back to the people in the images that we are seeing historically is uh, feels really important to us. Mm -hmm. A really human um, characteristic that we want to be able to share with them. They're one people are wondering about. Oh, I like the way someone phrases. They're really curious about the mini me standing behind her. Like, is that <laughs> the firstborn child? And I have to say, whenever I look at this image, I, I do notice the children, and I love that the children seem they have about their 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 bodies and their selves like a, a carefree, like that they're experiencing a bit of childhood. And I I love to see that in these images. Let me uh, just share a little bit more about sort of our our time period that we're here that this picture um, really does speak to me about. And so um, as Brianna mentioned at the end of the Civil War, there was a shift that had happened. Uh, newly freed African-Americans really faced a new world where they asked the questions about how they were gonna find their families would they be able to secure land such as we see here? How would they build their communities and would justice be given to them? And so when I look at this image, even though I know we have the questions of who is this image made for? What was the purpose of this image? But I also see in the way that the female uh, person has been placed as she's there in the front. I see this sort of maternal protectiveness of the people behind her. I see those um, really important uh, connections between the people that are on this property. I see family ties. I see protectiveness. I see the seeds of economic self-sufficiency and pride in what is their corner of the world. Um, and those are things that really stand out to me about what that precipice of opportunity and possibility that the newly freed were on at this time period. Next slide, please. So we have these two images and in the interest of time to make sure that we have an opportunity to hear as much background um, as possible, I just wanna invite um, us to think about ways that the image on the left and the right work together. And so what I'm going to do is propose two questions at once and then give a little minute of silence. So the first question is, in what ways do these two images connect to one another? That's question one. And then question two is, in what ways does the juxtaposition of these two images extend your thinking about this time period? Stretch it. So if you'll drop some ideas in the chat box, that'd be great. And Kendra, the way that you shared about these, the women in the front of the photograph was such a direct connection to me, to what you shared about the women on the left side of the painting and the, the, um, the familial connection, the protection. Um, so I, I had never seen that in all of our planning. And so I was really grateful that you shared that connection with me. Um, I'm curious to know, are there other connections that you two see or extensions? I think that through our conversation that we've been having and looking at these again even as you say through all our planning like it's there's still a freshness that you know we're mm -hmm. approaching it with in this space here with you all our participants and what I am seeing again is still this sort of protectiveness of the spaces that the black people are occupying so it's like mm -hmm. you're here and you you can come to this place within this space and then the other 
the other the, the rest of the space that's kind of not seen or behind us is our space mm -hmm. and that is um that's sort of standing out to me and making me just kind of think of what the ability to be able to kind of present a barrier um to opening their doors to whom they wanted to when they wanted to and that being very important um for African Americans a, a, a a right and a privilege of being able to determine those things that was denied to them under enslavement and what that would mean to be able to control their space. Yeah, Kendra, I'm going to jump in because there was a great question in the chat and I just, I, I, I've heard you say Black Americans, I've heard you say Black women, and just now you use the term African Americans. And there was a question in the chat about what's the most appropriate way to refer to the race or ethnicity of individuals in the portrait. And I use the um, signifiers that you just used interchangeably. Also, I wonder if if either of you have any guidance about using those terms. I like yourself, Elizabeth, use them interchangeably um, in writing. Um, one of the things that is, you know, in the last year or so has become more of the standard is to capitalize Black in writing. Um, when you're saying Black people, Black women, Black communities, to capitalize the, the term Black. Um, but I do use them interchangeably and depending on sort of the time period that I'm talking about, um, it may feel more appropriate to use Black people or people of African descent, especially if I'm talking pre-Civil War time period and I'm speaking of people that were enslaved and so did not have American citizenship mm -hmm. legally and officially at that moment. Um, but then African-Americans also is a term that I will use also to help reinforce mentally that people of African descent who have put work, blood, sweat, and tears into the foundation and the building and the making of this space here that is of the U.S. Uh, boundaries, that they are a part of the American culture that is here and so that they are American. So I will use that term sometimes very intentionally to help underscore that point. Thank you. Welcome. Brianna, do you have anything that you wanted to add in? No, I was just going to say I do. Um, I, I do the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so some of the things that people are noticing is the juxtaposition um, centers the story of women during Reconstruction, um, a connection being the absence of white people in the second photo makes me think of the increased freedoms that African Americans may have experienced. Um, expanding, and then an extension would be that extends or expands how I think about African Americans' connection to the earth and expression of identity. Um, and I think that's a really interesting uh, segue to the next part. Kendra, do you, shall we slide ahead? Let's slide on ahead. Let's slide ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, in the exhibition, uh, the theme of agency of the Black community is really prominent through, it's really prominent throughout. Um, the storyline really prioritizes four themes to showcase the desires of the newly freed. And so in the exhibition, we look at land and labor, we look at community, we look at democracy, and we look at family. And at this moment in history, so the moment that we were that we're talking about the moment that kind of is represented by this image here, the African American community really began to dream a world anew, a world without enslavement and a world of opportunity. Next slide, please. And if you would just page ahead, yes, wonderful. So Elizabeth, when we see all of these things here that reconstruction is. Mm -hmm. um, we collected terms that really depend, you know, as you're looking through the literature, as you're reading about this, all these different um, things that reconstruction could be, all these different adjectives for reconstruction. What are some of the ones that stand out for you? Um, unfamiliar, just like I said earlier, I, I realize that I have so I've either forgotten or not gotten um, a lot of information. And then I recognize in myself that when something is unfamiliar, I, f I fear it. Um, so the, some of the, the like subtext of this, the, the violence and untelling and, and all of that, um, it feels like, I, I don't know how to even get started. Yeah. 
I think for me, what stands out for, uh, as particularly out of the collection of adjectives that we have picked um, for here is that there was a turning point in US history. And that feels really significant because I'm thinking back to the way that I was taught about reconstruction and it was this very quick moment that happened between a really, you know, in my, in my, the way it was characterized in my education, really interesting war. Then there was this time period. And then it got really interesting again, because people got really rich in the Gilded Age. <laughs> and so like, yep. you know, reconstruction was kind of just something that happened in there in between. And I think when we have an opportunity to really pull students into the richness of this being a really significant turning point in US history, it can be so fascinating for us, for, for students to learn about and for us to kind of relearn what reconstruction is about. And I also see the, the term of opportunity. That is a, that's another term that kind of connects with me. It, I, you know, just as I mentioned it before with the photo, there was an opportunity and that's something that um, stands out for me as well. Yeah. Well, shall we page ahead and challenge our, our participants to catch their thinking? Well, I, yes, I think that would be a great, a great thing for us to do. And I know that we're coming up, going to build some more shared ground um, with some more content information. So this will be great. Beautiful. So we're going to have signposts throughout our time together, and this will be an opportunity for you to just kind of do some quick note taking. Um, so whenever you see a signpost, you're going to have one minute to just jot down anything that you find challenging, exciting, or valuable. And if you'll jot those on your own paper where you put your entrance narrative, that would be very helpful. As for exciting for me, Kendra, what you just said about being able to move into a space of richness and curiosity is really, ex that's exciting to me because then it makes um, history have, um, it's not just like little icebergs sticking up out of the water and we talk about this one and we talk about this one and then there's just like a blank space in between. And I, I really am excited at the prospect of looking at it as like a bridge or a, a path instead. Thank you for that. All that connectiveness, I think, makes history so much more interesting. Yeah, agreed. Um, so through the next through few slides, we're going to be um, building, or Kendra, thank you, Kendra and uh, Brianna, are going to be building um, some more background information. So, and all the while, we'll have these little signposts. Um, and so just keep Keep a note if ever your brain goes ding that's interesting that's exciting that's challenging that's valuable just like ding, just put it in the back of your mind Kendra I'm going to ask that we move ahead and, and I'll stop talking. Thank you. So at the beginning of the heart of the exhibition is a digital rendition of Frederick Douglass and he speaks words from a speech in 1865 where he was responding to the question of what was to be done with the newly freed. And he declared that he should be left alone. And so Douglas says, and I just say right now, I don't have the resonant baritone that I imagine Douglas to have, but here's his words. Douglas says, let him alone. If you see him on his way to school, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going to the dinner table at a hotel, let him go. If you see him going to the ballot box, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you will only untie his hands and give him a chance, I think he will live. Reconstruction was truly a period of African-American achievement. On this slide and the next, we're gonna highlight a few of the themes of, that's at the heart of the Black experience of Reconstruction. One of the most heart-wrenching aspects of enslavement was the separation and the threat of separation for Black families. As the newly free transitioned to live as free people, the wish to organize, gather, and conduct their families as they determined was a very important goal. The images that we are seeing here on this slide are evidence of those efforts. Um, from left to right, we're seeing a marriage license, we're seeing family portraits, and we're seeing snapshots of children being able to be children. Family was one of the primary driving forces for the visions of the newly freed and land ownership and control of one's labor was another. 
freedom really offered African Americans the opportunity to work for themselves and receive compensation for their labor. The economic independence gained through land ownership was crucial, and it offered a solid foundation for self-sufficiency as well as a form of wealth that could be passed down through generations. Next slide, please. Establishing and nurturing organizations that they controlled and owned were vital to the growth of stable African-American communities. One of the most important organizations to flourish would be the church. It was often the site for worship, site for political, or political organizing, and a site for many places, the place where the first schools were held, the first classes were held for the newly freed was inside the church. African Americans also had visions of freedom in terms of democracy, both big D democracy, which is holding political office and voting, but also little d democracy, that on the ground struggle for civil and social rights. And what we are seeing here on this slide are images of community organizations that came together to represent Black culture, advocate for voting rights, and push for social equality. And you will notice the familiar image to the left of the first U.S. Senator and first U.S. Congressman, so the first African-American U.S. Senator and first African-American U.S. Congressman. And that's a reminder to us of the over 1,500 African-American people that served in elected and appointed offices during Reconstruction at both the federal, or federal, the state, and local levels. May I have the next slide, please? So no discussion of Reconstruction would be complete without recognizing that the achievements and gains of the previously and newly freed were made against the backdrop of a shadow of oppression. As the post-war years progressed, there was a re-entrenchment of white domination through economic, social, and political oppression. These efforts also took the form of physical and emotional violence. Another avenue that white domination took was to create the lost cause mythology, which taught generations of people that Reconstruction itself was a failure and that the cause of the Confederacy was an undefeated and holy cause. And for a time, this mythology actively obscured the agency and achievement of the Black community. In spite of this backdrop, Black achievement, growth, and flourishing continued to occur. African-American citizens actively struggled against this violence. In 1871, in response to reports of violence in the South by the Ku Klux Klan, the federal government conducted an investigation. The testimony video that we're about to watch is just one example of what Black Americans experienced and had the courage to stand up and bear witness to. Roll the clip, please. I reckon they gave me 150 lashes, maybe more, maybe 200. They whipped me with a strap. They said that they understood that I had talked some talk concerning some white woman that was not nice, they thought. But I have witnesses that night that they tried to make me own, and I said that I didn't say it. It was only got up, that chap was, and, and they wanted to run me off. The man I lived with did on account of my crop, and that was why they got the Ku Klux to get after me. Bearing witness to the violence and injustice experienced was a powerful demonstration of courage and action. Just as we heard the words of one newly freed person, there were many other individuals who took actions, such as another prominent voice of the period, Ida B. Wells Barnett, known for her public crusade against lynching. So Ida B. Wells was um, the daughter of former enslaved people. She sued the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railway in 1883 after being dragged from her seat for refusing to move to a segregated rail car. Her anger over this incident spurred her to begin contributing articles to black owned newspapers. She became part owner and editor of both the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight in 1889. 
But in 1892, after three black businessmen were, were lynched in Memphis, Wells launched what became a four decade long anti-lynching crusade. And as Kendra said um, with the previous uh, slide that Wells activism is just one example of this continuing struggle. And if we move to the next slide, I think we're reaching a signpost. There is a signpost. So just as you did before, will you spend just a minute on your piece of paper capturing anything that you find challenging, ex exciting, or valuable? One more second. Let's keep walking along this path. Will you slide ahead? Next, Next slide. slide. <laughs> Thank you. So the era of reconstruction was a time of possibility that was deferred. We're now going to move forward through time um, into the 20th century and continue to follow some of the threads that we've been discussing, including the concepts of freedom, full citizenship, and economic self-sufficiency. Here you see a portrait of the poet Langston Hughes from 1925. His journal is open in front of him. He is deep in thought. Behind him, we see images and a setting that is all in blue related to Hughes's poetry, as well as the Harlem Renaissance. Langston Hughes really takes the mantle from Ida B. Wells and becomes the post-reconstruction voice of a time period where dreams and promises were yet to be fulfilled. And he continues to be that voice 26 years later when he wrote the poem Harlem in 1951, of which you see a small clip on the screen. So as we enter into the middle of the 20th century, we're gonna continue with this arc of ideas we've been discussing and take a look at the modern civil rights movement um, and particularly look closely at John Lewis, one of the most formidable figures of this movement. Next slide. You all know that I'm excited. <laughs> um, a relentless champion of voting rights and a politician known as the conscience of the nation, Lewis demonstrated a desire to affect social change uh, from a young age. And here we see Lewis, he is um, on the left side of this particular image of which we're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into. So I'd like everyone to take a moment to look, look from top to bottom, side to side, all around. Take in all of the visual elements that you see, the clues that you see that we might use to be able to tell the story of this image. And when you're ready, focus on the subject's poses, their clothing, as well as the setting, and drop your initial observations about those elements into the Q&A. And of course, I'm gonna ask the very same question of Elizabeth and Kendra. What strikes you when you look at this for the first time? What are those initial observations? Initially, I think they're very young people and that stands out to me. Um, maybe the, the two on the end, the two, the two young men on the end are maybe teen, teenage age or possibly like early 20s but then the one in the middle the, the figure in the middle I think is like elementary middle school age <laughs> and that's um that really uh, reminds me how much I have heard about the, the movement of the children in the civil rights movement mm -hmm. I'm I'm thinking about these people's knees on the concrete and this kind of 
prayerful pose. That's the connection that I make. Um, and thinking about what it would be to, to kneel on the concrete. So it, trying to imagine that feeling um, and, and also at the same time, the connection to one another that the three individuals are all wearing light colored um, shirts and they, their, po their pose, it's not a pose, but the, their posture um, is, is unifying. Right. And some of the responses that are coming in from our participants um, are echoing the things that you both have already said. Um, it looks as if they are praying, they are kneeling, um, and we can see just a hint of a facial expression um, of John Lewis. Um, and people are noticing that he is holding a paper in his hand, which, of course, I think probably leads us into a wondering of uh, what that might be. Um, oh, this is this is a really um, this is a really important comment that this idea of taking a knee has a deeper history than um, than the participant was necessarily aware of, um, and that the text enhances the comprehension of the image's message. Um, and there is uh, it's a pose of perhaps humbleness in prayer. Um, and there is a casualness uh, to the clothing, um, but the posture is not defensive. Um, it's really, it's brave. Um, and there is a nonviolent um, nature to it. These are all really wonderful observations. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm going to come back with a, a follow-up question once we've had a little bit of context um, about this image. Um, so the, the, photo, the photograph that you see um, is actually a poster. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. Um, so in 1962, the photographer, Danny Lyon, who was um, the official photographer for the Student, student Nonviolence non Coordinating Committee, um, he took this photograph of John Lewis and others um, protesting in Cairo, Illinois. Um, it was a direct action campaign challenging segregation. Um, and in particular, what you're seeing here is um, it is a vigil outside of the city's whites only swimming pool. So the image itself was created in 1962. And then in 1963, this particular image was used to create a poster. Um, an appeal that said, come let us build a new world together. The poster was printed um, and it was sold um, by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and it was priced at a dollar. And very, very, very quickly, um, the print run of 10,000 posters sold out. Um, and it was used um, really to, to raise funds for the organization's civil rights initiatives um, and to carry its message to a wide and largely youthful audience. Um, and I love that we take one medium of photography and we turn it into another medium of a poster um, to get that message out even more than the first. So now that you have a little bit of context um, around this poster and, and given that initial looking that we were doing, what begins to resonate as you're putting those, the observations and the context together? I'm of course asking participants. Andrew, Andrew, raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> something that struck me as you were uh, sharing the context with us yeah. is that this picture was taken in Illinois I think so often when we think about SNCC and we think about the civil rights movement we think about the work in the south mm -hmm. um, of the the southern states of the United States and I that that was that was new information to strike me today it's like oh this this happened in Illinois so this happened in what you know most of us would consider the north and then to think about this happening um around an integration of a swimming pool mm -hmm. and that being often um you know a a, a a hot tension ground um for race relations particularly in that time period so um that was really 
that stood out for me and then makes me also see this image a little bit uh, more nationally mm-hmm. than I might have thought about the story before, particularly regarding SNCC. Right, right. Thank you, Kendra. It's an excellent point. Elizabeth, what are you thinking? I'm just thinking about composition now and thinking about what a great photo it is and how smart to use the space of the sidewalk as the white space so that the the text can be on top of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, they are kneeling on this idea, like their foundation is this idea of building a new world together. And then I'm noticing the, um, the framing of their of John Lewis and the other gentlemen's heads, they are presented as, um, you know, of equal um, stature, uh, you know, there's this horizontal line across the top. Um, but then because the, the little girl, I think she's a girl in the middle is a little bit smaller, it's like they are lifting her. So it makes me think of that phrase that I think I've heard lifting as we climb. Um, yeah. And and I, I hadn't seen that before. So thank you for the context. Oh, Elizabeth, you just pointed out too there that strong visual triangle there between their three <laughs> heads. Yeah. I love my art colleagues. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and Elizabeth, um, you you must have been like vibing with one of the participants who's also said that it is so heartwarming, heartwarming to see the child between the two men. So there is that, you know, that that really lovely connection um, that is happening. And some of the other participants are talking about how SNCC was really smart um, about fundraising. Um, and also the postures look to me and to our participant now like they are uh, strength gathering um, mm-hmm. as they are about to do some big work. Um, and we have a wondering, I love the wonderings, who are the others and what are their future stories? Mm. Um, that's, that is amazing. And, you know, one of the, one of the pieces about, um, one of the elements of this poster, this photograph that always, always stands out to me, because as you both know, I deal in portraiture, which a lot of times has a single individual in a portrait that um, rather than depicting the action of one single individual, this poster and the original photograph, it it celebrates group-centered leadership, right? In which everyone works and struggles together side by side. And I think that, um, you know, in this particular moment, um, that is an incredibly powerful image to see. So now let's spend just a couple of minutes taking a look at John Lewis of 1962 um, and John Lewis of 2020. If you can move to the next slide. So this is the original Danny Lyon photograph. Um, and you can see that the, the poster cropped um, additional people um, out, of, um, out of the poster. So it's important to note that, you know, it is, it, there were more people um, participating in this vigil. This, this vigil. And so the, the photograph dates from 1962 and this beautiful painting of John Lewis that just came into the collection of the Portrait Gallery um, was painted by Michael Shane Neal in 2020. So these two images are 58 years apart. So what sorts of comparisons and connections can we make between these two images? What starts to bubble for everyone? Comparisons and connections. I'm going to jump in with the obvious, but I just, I mean, Lewis maintains such a tremendous stature. Um, I keep using that word over and over, apologies. But um, but then I see his bald head. I see the age in his face. I see he's, he's presented as, you know, fairly vigorous in this painting, but I'm thinking about how long he's been at this work, you know, that this is, this is a life's work over essentially generations. And, and um, I, it makes me wonder, like, where, where was his well of strength? Where, where was his well of, 
um, maintaining energy over that duration? And then also, why did he have to keep going back to that well? Yeah. We're seeing some of those similar comments coming in um, in the Q&A as well, that this was truly his life's work. And, you know, he has this this upright posture. He is engaged um, with the with the audience. Um, his hand is resting on something. Um, there is a, an idea of um, support that is there. What are you thinking, Kendra? When I see the painting, I I, I'm I was really vibing with a lot of the participant comments about the difference between his posture in 62 and then the 2020 painting and just that, you know, he's, it, it's a brave posture, you know, taking the knee, but then he's standing upright and strong in that 2020 painting. But also with the 2020 painting, what I see is that he's presented as sort of that elderly state, statesman. You know, and I see that that sort of strength and how he's being presented there. And in some ways, um, you know, I know that the photograph was taken and then turned into the port the poster, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, but in thinking about the portrait and like the portrait is so quiet in detail, you know, the background and everything, that it makes his power of just him as that sing single individual just resonate out of the portrait for me yeah I, I I have that feeling um a lot when I look at portraits where we are focusing on the individual alone right we we lack a setting we lack objects um so it forces us to to engage with our subject and really focus in on that power that empowerment um, and one of the things that you said struck me as I was thinking about um, the sort of uh, lack of background, lack of setting, um, and I hope that everyone can notice this, um, that, uh, you know, his, uh, his outline, it looks as if it is, um, it's sketched in charcoal, um, and there's a loose, unfinished, uh, brushwork to the to the edges of Lewis um, and the artist has said that he did that on purpose because it's meant to evoke the unending struggle for justice that Lewis made his life's work and it, it's such a small detail but becomes so poignant when when you know that piece of when you know that piece of context so before we move on I want to finish with a quote um, in 2020, um, it was the 55th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery marches. It was also the year that this portrait of John Lewis was painted. Um, and John Lewis said in 2020, speak up, speak out, get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. Next slide. What an incredible quote. Thank you for sharing that. Um, here we are at another signpost. This is the third of three, as you can see. So make sure that you capture anything from this um, stretch of road that you find challenging, exciting, or valuable, and grab that and put it down on your own paper. So part of what we're doing when we are taking these notes along the way is freeing you up to be able to listen, because now you know that there, there's a place where you're putting the things that are important to you. Um, and it's also creating a document that you can review and um, use to make sense of some of the bigger themes that we've been exploring together. So with 10 more seconds. Capture things that are challenging, exciting, or valuable. And let's go to the next slide. So this is our pause. This is a, an, a moment for synthesis. Um, and one of our core ideas or our core um, themes was this idea of building a new world. 
And we have asked the questions that you see on the screen. What does it mean to be a citizen? What is inequality? Who belongs and how do we fit together? We explored themes of um, land and labor, democracy and voting, um, family agency, and then moving forward through time, collective action, youth engagement, and nonviolent protest. So for yourself, just journal freely. When you think of building a new world, what of all of this connects for you? Or alternatively, how does this connect to today for you? And perhaps, Brianna, you'd be willing to share that quote again, because it's being asked for in the chat. Yes, I absolutely can. So again, this is um, 2020. John Lewis says, speak up, speak out, get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. One last thing I'll note while you're making your last um, jottings is that the woman who quilted the piece that we see on the screen now, um, her name is Sharon Carey Harlan. She made this work, which she entitled Portrait of Resilience from the Flag Series in 2020. So the same year as we saw the portrait of John Lewis, mm -hmm. she said, despite these dire situations, resilience among African-Americans and their allies help them help them I'm parentheses here build or realize a better future and so um, throughout our time together we're harvesting works from our three different collections as a way um, to hold tight to these ideas um, of of making a new world so if we could page ahead one more slide please here is a creative response at opportunity. So this is an opportunity where you can use your voice, um, just as I think it was Wells um, and Lewis have both exhorted us to use our voices. Um, harvesting your words from the paper on which you've taken all of your notes, um, reviewing your notes, and then using only a selection of words that you've written. Would you please spend two minutes answering Langston Hughes question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? So spend two minutes pulling words from your page in answer to Hughes's question. And if you'd like to share it in the Q&A box, I'd be grateful to see your work. Got about one minute left. So given that I know we're working with a teensy bit of a lag, um, I wonder if you would like to move ahead, Brianna, and then we can review all of these things together. Does that make sense? Sure. Do you want to, you want to go to what we've done together and then come back? Yes, let's do it. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you could move uh, two more, one more forward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I will say that I did notice in the, um, in the Q and A that ideas were already beginning to bubble even before the writing happened. 
um, that one participant was saying that they were interested in using the 1962 photo um, and comparing it um, to a, a photo of Lewis at a sit-in in Congress. Um, so mm -hmm. I love those bubbling ideas that are already be beginning to happen. Um, it's it's hard to believe that we've been at this already for an hour and 10 minutes. Um, it feels a little bit like a whirlwind, um, but I just wanted to highlight really quickly before we hear uh, some of uh, some of everyone's exit tickets, um, the, the tools that we used together today. Um, we wondered together. There was a lot of wondering um, that was happening, and it always brings me such joy when people have questions um, about objects and artwork. We listened to multiple perspectives and looked at multiple perspectives um, in the objects that we chose today. Um, not only did we seek connections, um, but we sought challenges as well. Um, we embraced complexity, a lot of complexity, but good, good complexity. Um, and we built a shared experience together, which I think is uh, pretty tremendous to do in, in, in this kind of environment. So thank you. And now can we go back a slide? <laughs> <laughs> so we have this exit ticket, right? We have this idea of, um, we, we at the very beginning, you may remember, we're answering the question, um, what did we even learn about reconstruction? And so now that we're at the end of the presentation component, one more writing for you is to choose between the two prompts on the page. One new understanding I have about reconstruction is blank, and with it, I wonder or will blank. And for time's sake, just to keep us all sane, one thing that's still on my mind is blank. So choose one. Write briefly about it. I want to make sure we conserve time for the reflection and Q&A, which is where I'm kind of hurtling us forward. Um, and Elizabeth, you got your wish. Um, there were a lot of really nice responses um, mm. to the two-minute found writing um, in, in the Q&A. Awesome. I look forward to looking at those. Thank you, guys. So for your own sake, um, you've just reviewed your page, and so maybe you've already looked at your entrance point, but now that you're at this exit ticket, just for a moment, a little metacognitive moment, think about what happened in between that helped shift or change your thinking, or if you didn't shift or change and were instead reinforced, what um, would you like to do with that? We're zooming ahead because we promised an open-ended panel discussion. I want to make sure we get there. So if you'll page ahead too, please, in the slides, I'd appreciate it. Um, so here we are. I think I get to answer the first question. Is that right? Yes, you do. Okay. I get to, I get to ask you. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> So one of the, the first question that we had that we wanted to talk about in this panel discussion was, I'm asking you, Elizabeth, how have you taught about reconstruction before? To be totally frank, and this is this is me speaking as an educator myself, this is not me representing my museum, but I have been very tender about it because I haven't quite known what to do or what to say. And when I'm thinking about the images that I have at my fingertips when we're together in real life in the galleries and I have that Winslow Homer painting, mm -hmm. I have found myself grateful to have it because it really inspires and um, promotes a lot of conversation. Um, and then also I have felt like I've needed to supplement it because um, it, it tells Homer's story. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how to do that in the time we had available. And and I was actually kind of re, I don't know how to call it really, but like I felt um, perhaps similar to what other teachers have mentioned online about the challenges of teaching reconstruction, that there's so much to teach and you're supposed to just kind of squeeze it in. And um, I think for fear of doing it poorly, I've kind of avoided it. So 
um, that's, <laughs> that's my honest answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Brianna, do you want to weigh in or shall I ask you our next delightful question? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, Elizabeth, as you were answering that question, I was thinking about what I've done during my time at the portrait gallery. Um, and it has been specifically focused on a portrait. So on the artwork itself and framing the conversation around the artwork, mm -hmm. but honestly not really venturing beyond that. Um, which I think is is why the conversation that we've had today has been so important because it's allowed us to really not only link images in our collections, our three collective museums, but also to consider that um, that timeline, right? That mm -hmm. that arc that we've been talking about. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm ready for my question. I'm gonna pepper you. Okay, um, I'm ready. So how do your discussions of portraits evolve as you learn more about them? Um, that's such a big question. Um, and obviously, this is a question that I knew was coming because it was on our PowerPoint. But I was thinking <laughs> about um, I, I was thinking about this idea of the democratization of portraiture. Um, and I've been at the portrait gallery for um, for quite a number of years now, um, and the the evolution of how I use portraits certainly has evolved, and it evolves because um, history changes, history evolves, stories change, new perspectives come in. But the the one that has really this idea of the democratization of portraiture continues to. Um, be very much a part of my teaching practice because I think it's so important. And that is that, you know, prior to um, photography, portraiture was an elitist art form. Mm -hmm. The people who had their portraits created um, were more often than not um, white men who could vote, um, who had wealth, who owned land. Um, and there were certainly works on paper, um, but with the advent of photography in 1839, we start to see a variety of perspectives coming into the story, which allows us to tell a more complete story of our history when we can not only take a look at paintings, but we can also take a look at photographs, um, posters, lithographs, um, and things like that. And that's been that's been really amazing. Um, and I've seen that with some of the shows um, that we've had over time as well. All right, it's my turn. <laughs> Kendra, are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> How do we teach this content in a digestible way? And what are some of the hard decisions that were made when creating Make Good the Promises? All right, digestible ways. Um, I feel like uh, all of the educators that are a part of this session probably have, they spend a lot of time thinking about how do I break a topic down to make it digestible, right? And so this is just part of what we begin to learn to do, but it's always, I think at least for, for myself, it's just something that I have to think about. What's the entry point? What's a good entry point into a conversation? What are where are the places where there's going to be complexity that I may want to step back and find a commonality in a way to um, become a you know get our, my students or my participants into this story? And so, what I think about with reconstruction specifically is teaching the humanity of the story and is finding those human stories to be a part of how you teach about reconstruction, how you enter into the conversation. Also think that for educators out there, and I think this is um, something that we like to do 
um, at our museum, but then also as we're talking with educators across the nation and the world, is like finding local connections to that larger period and those themes. So if it's a theme of family, it's looking for local connections that might talk about families during the time period of reconstruction in your own area, or looking for places where maybe there are black owned businesses that were started during the time period of reconstruction, or looking for other examples of how people, um, other groups, other ethnicities, races, and groups of people outside of African Americans also were struggling and pushing for their rights and their uh, recognition as uh, citizens of this uh, society. And then I think about how you can consider about museum objects and how other primary sources also can serve as entry points or points of discovery for students. I think sometimes when we use a what might seem neutral type of object to enter in a story, it can allow us to open the conversation that we might think, oh, this topic is going to be really challenging, but starting with that museum object or primary source can help that conversation grow in a way that people can get comfortable first. And then your other question about the exhibition, um, I had the honor to serve uh, on the team as the exhibition educator, and it was a fantastic experience. The probably the biggest challenge is the one that we just talked about, right, is how did we, how could we narrow down the story to a digestible piece, to different digestible pieces, but not strip it of the nuance that we were really trying to help people discover or rediscover about the period. And then I think another hard decision was thinking about the legacy section. How do we show the positive legacies and the legacies that are still left for us to grapple with? How could we tell a story that really allows people to make those historical and contemporary connections, but then leave feeling empowered to take their place in that historical arc? We really wanted people to see themselves in the story of Reconstruction and its legacies. And this whole question and this experience just really brings to mind some of the questions that we open this session with, like who belongs and how do we fit together? Mm -hmm. Let's move into uh, an opportunity for some Q&A and thank you for bringing up the next slide. Um, just an opportunity to have some, some Q&A for our audience that's out there. What questions might be on your mind for us about our session and some of the material that we've shared? And while you all are adding into the Q&A box about some things that are on your minds, we can share a little bit about why this, why putting together, how the, the process of us putting together um, this presentation was, you know, where our challenges were in putting together this presentation. So I open to my colleagues, what were some of our challenges? <laughs> <laughs> well, so many. <laughs> so many. Uh -oh. I'll go first. Um, I think as everybody can see um, in the slide that was just up, um, there were a lot of images that we were considering, a whole lot of images. Um, and it was, it was difficult. It was challenging to not only narrow the images, but also to think really thoughtfully about the images that we were going to be introducing. Um, and it just, what you just said, Kendra, resonated me with me about um, the choice of images, right? Mm -hmm. Because you want those images to be used in a way that are going to open up a conversation. Um, and it is, it's important to choose the right ones that are going to do that and are not going to shut the conversation down. Right. Yes, and the, I sure. think just as you said, I'll, I'll continue that thought, at least for my part, Brianna, is that wanting to find an image that was simple enough to make sense of, but not so simple to oversimplify. Um, so it, it, that for me felt like a, a tension. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and we, um, we have a question um, about um, what's the most efficient way to access these images. Um, and I will just let everyone um, who's participating know that we've created a learning lab collection um, in conjunction with this session. Um, so we'll be sure to put the link to that learning lab collection on our sessions page um, within the National Education Summit website, um, hopefully up today or tomorrow at the latest.
I was thinking about one of the challenging things for me uh, as a facilitator with this um, presentation is that I'm always thinking about how we can represent Black agency, Black accomplishment, Black achievement, Black joy in our conversations so that we can recognize that aspect of the humanity of the Black community. Um, oftentimes, I think our stories, when we are referring to African American history, can come from a place of, um, can, can start at that place of violence and tragedy and oppression and having things that are done to Black people in the Black community. And so it's always a goal of mine and from our museum to provide that humanity and to provide a more well-rounded picture of what the Black community has been and continues to be. Yeah. Um, I will just note in um, in the chat while we we don't have questions. I think we must have covered everything. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. So comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did get a really lovely comment. Um, one understanding is um, that this participant has new works of art um, that they will add into their teaching. So success. <laughs> I see also one of the exit tickets says keep working for change so reconstruction will be fully realized. Um, mm. So thinking about that idea of legacy stretching to today. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. How do you answer the question about artistic liberty when analyzing images? Artistic liberty. Oh, that's an interesting query. Right. We, we often at the Portrait Gallery talk about it. Um, as artistic interpretation, right? Because yeah. if we're if we're thinking about the painted likeness of an individual um, that might not necessarily, or maybe based off of a photograph, you do always have to take into consideration that artistic interpretation. I don't. I haven't really ever thought about it as liberty, um, but I mean, it is. It's it's something. It's something to consider, um, and I think it's one of the reasons why um, we can have a debate um, about whether or not paintings can be primary source objects That's or beautiful. documents. Oh, you're starting something, Brianna. I know. I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there. I knew I would, Kendra. <laughs> you and I have had this conversation before. <laughs> I, you know, as, as someone who is primarily based in what would be considered one of our history museums, when the question is asked about artistic liberty and you talk about artistic interpretation, I also see it as the artist is bringing their experience, their lived experience and their lens to whatever artwork they're creating. Yeah. And so it's an, it for me is an opportunity to talk about the context of the artist, mm -hmm. where they have, where they've lived, where they've grown up, the experience they've, that experiences that they've had that perhaps they are bringing to them their subject. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a way that I kind of think about the artistic liberty slash interpretation is that it's part of how the artist lens is impacting yeah. what's in front of I us. I see, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just see that we're so short on time and there's one incredibly practical question, Let's which is there. how would you chunk this? Because this was just a 90 minute session. How would we chunk this for the classroom? Oh, mm -hmm. I know how I would chunk parts of it. Jump I mean, in. I, I would definitely, <laughs> um, the comparison with um, a visit from the old mistress, mistress and the photograph, I think that is its own mm. separate chunk. Mm -hmm. um, just like I think um, taking a look at John Lewis is its own separate chunk. And then maybe some of the bits and pieces in the middle can be used um, as, as homework. And so you can use them as really um, portions of a class, um, maybe over time instead of uh, one class period. Yeah, like that. Given our time, shall we equip these people with resources so they know where to go? Yes, let's, do, let's it. do it. Will you slide ahead one, please? Beautiful. Yes. Um, so all of these links um, are in the slideshow that is on our session page um, on the website. So you, no need to take any quick snapshots 
Um, but what we've really done here is we've tried to give you um, a number of learning lab collections. This again is uh, the Smithsonian's educational platform for um, bringing together resources and content and objects. Um, so you'll see on this first slide that there are three learning lab collections. Take us through to the next one. Next slide, please. And then we've got some additional collections as well as the website for um, Make Good the Promises. And Kendra, I'm going to turn it over to you for the last slide. Absolutely. We are the inheritors of this narrative. And so the question is, what will we do? So we wanted to leave you with this excerpt from Langston Hughes's poem, I Dream a World. And just want to thank you for your participation, your time, and your energy. And in the spirits of Douglas and Lewis, go out, get in some good trouble, and make good promises. Thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>